Hello and welcome to this webinar brought to you by Cushion, the fintech workplace savings business determined to get people thinking about their financial future. I'm Iona Bain and I'm best known for being the founder of Young Money Blog and I've gone on to become a kind of go-to voice on young people's finances in the UK. I do a lot of speaking, writing, broadcasting and most recently I've written a book called Own It, all about how we can get more young people to invest their way to a better future. And I have a particular interest in what I like to call big money. That is all the financial products that make the biggest difference to people's lives and in society and how we can get more young people informed and enthused about these products. So it's great to see Cushion uh, publishing uh, very recently an in-depth and fascinating white paper on these very issues called Pensions to be Proud of. Uh, and I just want to give you all an overview of what this research shows. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, going to surprise you to hear that younger people find pensions very complex, full of jargon. Uh, people don't really understand how tax relief works, which is a worry considering what a big incentive this is for people who do understand it. Uh, one piece of good news that came out of the white paper is that there is a broad understanding of the value of employer contributions, uh, but overall young people really lack basic knowledge, not only of how pensions work, but when they should start saving and how much they should put in. And one of the figures that really surprised me from the white paper was that a third of young people don't think pensions are necessary at all. They don't, they don't understand why they need a pension. So I think that gives you an idea of the kind of challenges that we're up against. And who better to discuss those challenges than Baroness Ros Altman, who is probably the most respected authority on pensions in the UK. Her many achievements include serving as pensions minister under David Cameron, being a government business champion for older workers, being awarded the CBE in 2014, and being an all-round friend to consumers on all things personal finance. And Ros also recently became an advisor to Cushion, so she has a lot to say on the subject of how we can engage younger savers, as do I. Uh, so Ros, uh, let's kick off by just asking ourselves, how come young people are so apathetic and ignorant when it comes to pensions. Um, what do you think are the main challenges there in terms of getting young people to care about pensions? Well, I think you're right. Young people do need help, but so does everyone else, actually. Mm. Most people, unfortunately, don't understand how pensions work, how good they are, uh, how much, if you like, free money is available to them, not just from their employer, but also from other taxpayers that they wouldn't have uh, to invest with if they were saving in other types of savings schemes. So it is really important for young people to have the education that can help them see what good pensions can do for them uh, and ultimately, actually, for wider society, potentially. So yeah, you, the, the findings of, of the cushion research, I think, are really important. As you say, if one third of people, when they're young, don't even think they need a pension, they could be in for a rude awakening later on. But more importantly, they are likely to be losing out on a tremendous opportunity to benefit from long-term investment and extra money that they wouldn't otherwise have uh, for their later lives so they have a better lifestyle mm. when they get older. Mm. You touched on some really interesting issues there, which I want to bring out as, as we go through our discussion. Um, but firstly, I want to pick up on this idea that younger people just don't understand how tax relief works, because the research does show that people more or less grasp the value of employer contributions but they just can't get their heads around tax relief. Now, is, is that their fault or is it because we need to simplify the tax relief system? Well, I certainly don't think that it is right to blame the consumer for failing to understand something that's really complicated uh, and that is often um, not understood by both employers and those who are contributing. The, the tax relief system in the UK is extraordinarily complicated. The principle of tax relief is really simple, but by calling it something that is uh, involving the word tax, for example, 
some people who really have no um, education or understanding in, in these kind of issues reportedly think that that's a bad thing, not a good thing, that somehow yeah. pensions are taxed. Yeah. Well, of course, tax relief is money added by government to your pension. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're a basic rate taxpayer, if you pay 20% tax, every four pounds you put in to your pension, you get an extra pound for free. It's a kind of buy four, get one free offer. Yes, you'll be taxed on it later, but in the meantime, all that extra money will be invested and hopefully grow for you over the long run to be worth a lot more than it is nowadays. But people don't have that explained to them. You know, the, the, the level of misunderstanding, uh, especially among people who would never dream of needing a financial advisor, for example. You know, the, uh, those who are better off maybe paying higher rates of tax um, get even more benefit from the extra incentive in their pension paid by other taxpayers. In the case of a 40% taxpayer, for every three pounds they put in, they get another two pounds added to their money so that's a really strong incentive and if somebody is explaining that if you've got a financial advisor and of course only a very small minority of the workforce will have one and someone to sit there and explain that to them uh, then you might understand it but what we need is for everybody to see that you don't just get extra money from your employer you should get extra money from the uh, rest of taxpayers uh, in, into your pension. And even if you're not a taxpayer, you still get extra money uh, worth one pound for every four pounds of yours into your pension. That there, there are exceptions to that, and that's part of the reason why it's so difficult to help people understand it, because there are complexities that are really unhelpful. Um, and also, you know, for the lowest earners, there, there are problems uh, in this area. But for the vast majority of, of people, tax relief is something that we could rename and help people understand better and also identify it separately. When you get your pension statement, you don't tend to see how much extra money has gone into your pension from other taxpayers you mm -hmm. see an overall figure mm -hmm. it's the same with employer contributions you don't always see how much extra the employer puts in for you that could be a really powerful way of starting to get people to understand how pensions work and this extra free money if you like uh, that they wouldn't have if they weren't saving in a pension. Yeah, that's a really interesting suggestion because I think one of the biggest problems with pensions is that people cannot actually grasp the value of their pension in the here and now and they don't understand the, the various benefits that they get with their pension uh, because they're just not communicated to the members. They're not communicated to savers. And so do you think that a lot of this is around... It, it is, a lot of the problems here are around how schemes communicate with their savers as well. Do you, what kind of improvements do we need to see in communications? Well, I think certainly an important part of the uh, issue would be helped by much clearer communications. And indeed, the government has proposed a simple annual standard statement that everybody should be uh, in future able to receive about what their pension savings look like, how much they've got, how much it could be worth in future and so on. And, and that, if it's in a standard format, would be a big step forward because pension companies use the most complicated terms for the same thing, but each company has its own wording sometimes. Mm -hmm. So instead of calling it your pension, they may call it your retirement savings or your retirement income or your 
benefits. You know, there are lots of different words that can be used. I think standardization would be really helpful. Clear, simple communications that explain how much you've put in yourself, how much extra has gone in, what's happened to the money over a period of time, say, uh, would be the basic building blocks that you would have thought would have been introduced already. But somehow the pensions industry loves its jargon yeah. <laughs> and keeps using uh, words that mean little or nothing or indeed can be off-putting to people who don't have experience with pensions. So it is really important, I think, for communication to be clearer, but what would certainly help the industry in this regard is if the government were to realise that we need to simplify the rules as mm -hmm. well. Yes, because in a way we've, we've got this double whammy of a complex system where people have to get their heads around their annual allowance, tax rate, qualifying earnings, not to mention the lifetime allowance and the difference yeah. between tax relief paid at source or through a net pay arrangement, you know, and I think the research does suggest that young people and women in particular would be more incentivized to contribute more to their pension if the system was simpler. But the pensions industry just does not help itself in the fact that until very recently, as you mentioned with the introduction of the, um, the simplified annual statement, until that point, you know, people were still receiving reams and reams of documents in the post, you know, death by jargon, really. Uh, and there was this sense that actually, you know, it, it, it didn't matter if we just allowed different schemes to use different words uh, for the same things, uh, that, you know, people would just automatically get their heads around what it all meant. And of course, now we realise that, that that's not the case. And I think this well. brings us on to education, whereby we just simply do not have young people leaving school understanding even what a pension is and I think about a quarter of young people report having had no education on pensions and savings uh, by the time they they leave school and uh, I think that this contributes to a lot of misunderstandings around pensions such as the fact that a third think they can wait until the age of 50 to start saving into their pension so I mean Ros I'm interested it's it's really absolutely I, I'm just interested Ros to kind of get your thoughts on you know whether financial education can really help in this area you know obviously that's not to say that we can't have a greater simplification of the system and that we can't you know encourage the industry to be much more straightforward in how it talks to savers but but would consumers be better off if they were more informed about this stuff and and if so who takes responsibility for this you know does it have to come from the government or should the industry be stepping up to the plate more I absolutely believe that consumers would be better off uh, if they did understand better how pensions work because pensions are actually a brilliant product. They uh, are helpful to you, both in the short run because you have more money growing for you and also in the long run because you'll have more money to live on in later life. The problem we have is that if you want and indeed we need to educate people about pensions. We have got to use language that is something they can relate to. Mm. Sticking with the jargon is not going to work. If you were to try and sell someone a car by explaining the intricacies of the different plugs and how they go into the carburetor, or, or talk about um, the complicated bits of the engine or the steering mechanism yeah. when you're trying to say this is a great car people will just not take that seriously yet somehow when it comes to pensions those people in the industry have never understood how to sell or market or explain to an ordinary consumer who is not a pensions expert even if you are a brain surgeon or a rocket scientist, you may understand a lot about your area and people outside wouldn't have a clue. Yeah. But you still often won't understand what on earth somebody who's explaining pensions is talking about. A very simple example, 
I think, could be um, what we have in the workplace where we don't expect people, the, the ordinary workforce, to be able to invest their money and know what to do. So there is set up for them what is called a default fund. Yeah. And that very word to you and me and everybody involved in pensions is natural. Mm. You know, it just means the standard one, the expert's choice one, whatever it is, a sort of regular one size fits all approach. But to someone who's never heard of that term, telling them that if they don't make a choice about their investments, their money is going to go into a default fund is hardly likely to attract them to want to put their money in or put more mm, in mm. over time. Because usually people are not very keen to default on anything, especially when it comes to money. Yeah. So just that simple example of really unhelpful language that could be changed to make it much more understandable to ordinary people and help them uh, be able to see what their pension is doing. I, I think there is a huge opportunity to help people understand it. Yeah, I completely agree. I think we almost need to have a, a radical reassessment really of the language that we use around pensions and ask ourselves, Absolutely. even if if we should have the word pension anymore i mean for a lot of people it's got baggage and and a lot of that baggage is quite negative uh, and pensions have changed unfortunately. unfortunately absolutely and and because you know there there have been lots of scandals within the industry in the past although you know regulations and 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 standards have improved massively over time I think there's still this this negative perception around pensions and also you know i wrestled with this when i was writing my book how we actually refer to the process of contributing to a pension because for me on the one hand saving does describe kind of what the act of, of contributing to a pension is but on the other hand I, I sort of felt uncomfortable using that term because you're putting your money into a into a pot that's also invested in the stock market and nowadays if you're in a defined contribution scheme you are taking risks and you have to be informed about those risks and actually you know there is this argument that we should be encouraging younger people to take more risks and perhaps the default isn't necessarily risky enough so i think for me it shows that there needs to be a greater awareness about kind of stock market investing as well as you know the importance of pensions and it's such a vast area uh, that you know i don't hold out much hope that we could properly teach that to young people in schools and that's why the industry in my opinion needs to step up to the plate and, and start providing some of that education because um you know it's it's just not i just think that the, the education system is is under so much pressure as it is and you know a personal finance education is not you know happening across the board even though it is compulsory and it's it's not covering all the subjects that it needs to cover either well i i think you're absolutely right um and ideally you would probably want to find another word for private pension yeah. so that the state pension is the pension yeah. the bit that you get automatically from the state and the rest of it is whether you call it life builder or retirement funder or, or future fund another word that's my favorite future fund yeah any of those but we need one yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the meantime using the word pension at least helps people see what we're talking about traditionally certainly the older mm. ones uh, uh, but we need to help them see what this all means. And at the heart of this problem, in my view, uh, and I agree with you that there is a huge role and indeed opportunity for pension providers to step up to the plate here uh, and help people understand this, is the fact that pension companies and pension funds in the past have never 
sold direct to a consumer. Pensions have always been sold to the consumer by a middle person. It hasn't been a direct to consumer D to C exercise. Mm. So when the pension companies have been designing products or even basic literature, it's used by an advisor or a salesperson to then approach the end customer. Yeah. And that itself has, has left us with an industry that is not suited to the consumer in many different ways. You know, it's the source of some of the scandals, but it's also the source of some of the lack of understanding. Mm. And it's a completely different approach if you are trying to sell your product to the end consumer, or if you're trying to sell it to an expert or to someone who knows all about it already, and then they have the responsibility to explain it to someone else. Yeah. So we need uh, an industry approach, which at some point, I believe we must get where a, a company decides that it is going to do target marketing for the end consumer not the middle person, it's going to sweep away a lot of the um, language that people don't understand and start talking about the free money. Mm. You know, it, if somebody stood up and said, here's a 50 pound note, I can give it to you for 20 pounds or even 30 pounds, yes. most people would bite your hand mm. off and say, that sounds like a great deal to me. Mm. But the pensions industry has never talked that kind of language. Uh, part of it is perhaps to do with regulation. I don't know. Um, but I don't think that that is an insurmountable problem at all. Uh, and in the end, surely this is in the pensions industry's own interest. Because if people understood how brilliant pensions were and how much free money they could have building up for them in later life, they're much more likely to put more money in. Whereas what the industry still keeps saying is, yeah, auto enrollment is great. Yes, you've given us uh, 10 million more people saving in a pension and we've got billions of pounds mm. from it. Yeah, that's great. But you know, it's not enough. You've got to go back to people and force them to put more in. You've got to increase the contribution yeah. levels because we want more money. Now, most consumer goods would not dream of saying to the government, could you please hand us some more customers on a plate? <laughs> could you please hand us uh, some more? You know, we, we, we're not going to market to them. Uh, we'll just sit here and wait for you to bring more because we all know that people should do more. It's time for the industry to say, great, auto enrollment is a fantastic start. We know how much people can benefit from putting more in. And we're going to reach out and tell them that and tell them why and incentivize and encourage them mm. to want to put more in. Yeah. That hasn't happened yet, but I hope it no. will. I, I completely agree with you. And I think there needs to be a consensus within the industry that that's the right approach to take, because at the moment, there's a very clear divide. And we actually saw this in the last webinar that we did with Cushion in the comments section. There is there is still a very strong contingent within the pensions world that believes engagement is pointless. People don't want to be thinking about retirement, which could happen many decades from now. Um, and it really, there's no way of getting more people interested in pensions. It's, it, it is what it is. It's, it's dry, it's boring, but it's necessary. It's just a fact of life. And the best way that we can get people to just make sure that they have saved enough for retirement is to, for instance, have auto escalation, i.e. have uh, pension contributions automatically going up as you go through your career and your earnings rise. So we just don't have that consensus yet that actually, no, people need to, to understand this product and how it works. And you can't just have people blindly contributing more to it without grasping what it is. Uh, listen, I, I think you're right. Um, but we could have auto escalations straight away if, if the industry got its act together. Pension providers 
could be in touch with employers. And as soon as they know that somebody's having a pay rise, the, again, the provider themselves could say, well, why don't you put half of it into your pension? Yeah. But unless people understand why they want to put money into a pension or why it's good for them to put money into a pension, that message is not going to get through. And, and of course, what the industry is basically saying is with the current approach, we'll never succeed in enthusing people and interesting people about their pensions. If, if we can, if we keep using the same language, we keep having the same product mindset, we, we keep talking uh, in the same way, then we haven't got a hope of attracting people. Yes, I agree with that, but I would have hoped that there would be uh, one or two or more disruptors in the industry who would come in and take a different approach of actually making pensions much more consumer friendly, um, helping people understand maybe prizes or lotteries uh, attached to it in the way that ordinary consumer goods are of, often need to be sold. Certainly at the beginning, you, you, you need to incentivize people to get in there. Once they're in, and I, I agree, using a behavioral nudge is really important and has been hugely successful beyond anything anyone ever thought mm. of, uh, then you've also got the opportunity to sell them more. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I think, uh, that that reminds me of some research that I saw not that long ago, which kind of looked at what incentivizes people the most when it comes to saving more. And it found that, you know, coming back to what we were saying about tax relief, taxes is quite an abstract concept for most consumers. But if they feel like they're getting a bonus, you know, in the here and now, that is is a real uh, in, it's a real motivator for, for consumers to save more. They feel like that they're getting a reward for doing the right thing. And this is this is what saving into a pension is. It's, it is doing the right thing for you. And it could also be about doing the right thing for society as a whole. So I wanted to get your thoughts on this idea that actually the key to engaging younger people is to talk about how their pension is invested and whether or not it is helping to tackle climate change, whether it's helping to solve social problems and so on. Do you think that's really the key to getting young people interested in what could otherwise be, you know, as I said before, quite a dry and boring area? I certainly think it's, it's one of the key issues and that's why I am so uh, happy to be advising Cushion because I think what they are picking up on is the opportunity to help people see how much good their pension investments can do now and during the time when they're waiting for their retirement. And particularly the young have a much longer time horizon over which their money could be doing good for society, for the planet, as well as for their own future. So if you get people thinking about what their pension is actually investing in and that it's not doing harm to the planet, but is actually helping the planet mm -hmm. or doing social good, for example, investing in alternative sources of energy, for example, investing in social housing, in infrastructure that can build better roads and, and get people um, communicating in a more user-friendly way or investing in research companies and life sciences that will develop tremendous medical advances. All of that yeah. is a, a long-term investment opportunity, but people don't even know what their pension money is doing. Nobody tells them. Again, their pension provider could be picking up on uh, one or two of the really exciting investments that are being made with their money and get them proud of it, get them starting to talk to their friends. I mean, yeah, this is what my pension money is doing. What about yours? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think this is one area where actually the pensions industry and the government are pretty much in agreement 
that, that this is the way to go. Uh, it's just a question of, of how fast the timetable is. So, you know, uh, the, the white paper from Cushion has called on uh, providers to commit to net zero sooner and for the government to play its part in, in putting pressure on providers to meet that goal sooner as well. So do you think that the industry is being ambitious enough at the moment? Well, I certainly think the government deserves credit for uh, encouraging in such a positive way pension schemes and pension investors to invest in um, environmentally friendly ways and in more socially responsible ways. You know, that's really important. It, it, we're, we're a world leader, actually, mm. in requiring pensions to uh, explain how they are uh, mitigating climate change or, or um, lowering emissions or, or, or meeting the kind of net zero targets. So we, we've made a good start. Um, we also need to think about, as we were saying, the contributions uh, and the uh, way in which people can understand how their contributions are actually uh, producing good outcomes here. Yeah. Uh, and that's part of the, the communication challenge. But there are a lot of companies that are being uh, slow to adopt and resisting the adoption of the um, environmentally friendly message. Some fear that it will affect their short term performance. But actually, we should be judging pensions over the long term, not the short term. And many companies are at significant risk from climate change. So pension investors can benefit from diversifying into these environmentally friendly investments because it could offset risks in other areas of their portfolios. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think this also brings us neatly onto technology. I think it's staggering that we just do not have as standard apps where people can manage and look at their pension uh, and, and you know, engage with their providers through that channel. The, the fact that that is not something that is offered as standard by all schemes is staggering. Um, why do you think that we've made such slow progress in this area? And, and why is the industry so kind of resistant to embracing technology? Because it, it has been adopted so much more widely elsewhere in the financial industry. You know, we have the rise of open banking, challenger banks becoming so much more popular, forcing the main high street banks to up their game. You know, all of them now offer a pretty good banking app. So why don't we have the equivalent happening in the pensions world? Well, again, this is an area where Cushion has seen the opportunity. Cushion has developed really, I think, exciting um, apps and interfaces, which the rest of the industry is struggling to keep up with. Uh, they have been dragged kicking and screaming into the modern technological era. They still are not there. Part of it is the legacy. You know, they've got decades of paper records mm. still, which, you know, relate to people who, who are in, in the workplace, millions of them. And they have never had a standard um, data standard that they will all then use to put records into a consistent format. Uh, the other valid explanation, of course, is that pensions are not like a bank account. They are far more complicated. It might be easy to put a sum of money on uh, an app, but pensions have many more other features than just the amount of money in it. And therefore, it's not straightforward to be able to put the money in uh, some kind of app and, and um, technological record that's part of the function of the complexity of the system. And, and all of that goes hand in hand with the difficulties that there are for the ordinary consumer. Uh, it's allowed the pensions industry to hide things in the past and maybe have very high fees, which people didn't understand. The government's not gonna let them get away with that for much longer either. So, you know, we're making good progress, but, the investment in technology is way behind where it needs to be. Uh, the pensions dashboard should should help. I hope it will. Uh, but, but, you know, 
we're not even at first base yet because we haven't got a data standard data records are not all reconciled and corrected yet so this is an exercise that is going to take time but in the meantime pension providers can and cushion has shown this move forward in ways that will be attractive to the consumer and helpful to the consumer yeah absolutely and i think one of the the most interesting recommendations from the white paper uh, was that we should look at having voting rights as an option on an app so that savers could feel like they were able to uh, participate in the big decisions being made by the scheme and that they were having their say and i think that's a really good tangible example of how we can make technology work for people in this area because it's all very well saying okay we need better technology but you know as you say firstly pensions are more complicated than bank accounts and secondly just because you've got a fancy app you know you have to think about what what action you actually want the saver to take uh, and it could be that actually you want them to be more connected with what they're invested in because you've identified that as being the key to engagement. So therefore it makes sense to offer them voting rights at company AGMs and so on. So I think that's a really good example of, of how technology can take this all forward. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, as, as you say, we're, we're not really there with the pensions dashboard yet and it's going to take some time. And that's why the industry kind of needs to get ahead of that and, and start innovating now and looking at what it can do uh, and, and maybe kind of identifying you know what can be done uh, and, and and what should be done and not hiding behind this sort of veil of complexity which I think can often be invoked as an excuse for for lots of things that don't get yeah. done but should get done <laughs> I mean the the industry is way behind where it should be and it in my view is also missing an amazing opportunity that has arisen unexpectedly yeah. as a result of the pandemic yes Lots of people have suddenly got huge amounts of money on a relative basis to what they had before in bank accounts, doing very little. The opportunity for a pension company to reach out and tap into some of that money and say, why don't you put it in, in extra pension contributions? Yeah. That, you know, explaining why it's so good for them and can be boosted by government. You're not earning any returns on your um, ordinary bank account. If you try and put it in an ISA, you don't get the extra uh, from tax relief straight away. Uh, and if you're doing it by the workplace, you'll get extra money from the employer as well. So there is an opportunity to just sell direct to the consumer yeah. here. Because the consumer, lots of people, millions of people have got money they didn't expect to have. Uh, and rather than just go out and, and spend it straight away, if, you, if they thought it could do some good, and a lot of us after the pandemic, perhaps have a, a, a higher social conscience than we might have had before and want to be sure that we're doing good things and, and investing in ways that will boost the economy as well as help um, protect the planet. All of those things are an opportunity for the industry. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a good point, Roz. I think perhaps we need to have a campaign encouraging people to put their lockdown savings to good use in a pension, to help themselves and the environment and society. But there is a very limited window in which to do that because <laughs> people will go out and spend that money at some point. Exactly. Um, I just want to ask you about a couple of things before we wrap up. Um, you know, we talked about the fortunate people who've been able to save more and, and could put that money towards their pension. Let's talk about people on the opposite end of the spectrum who are lower earners, who may not have any money in easy access savings and may also be caught out by the net pay anomaly. Um, you know, what do you think about the recommendation that the cushion has made to have a kind of auto enrollment for savings at work? And, and also, you know, when are we going to sort out this net pay problem? Well, I absolutely think that it is vital for the government to sort out the net pay issue as soon as possible. It was a manifesto commitment. We've had a call for evidence. We've had no reply uh, from the government yet. And month after month or week after week, in some cases, people are putting money 
into their pension and being charged an extra 25% just because of the complex way that tax administration pensions works. Now, HMRC has an opportunity to address this. It has chosen so far not to. The most important thing for me is that providers and uh, any of the consumer groups who, who understand this need to help people recognize this cannot go on. If you want more people saving in a pension and you want them to save more, clearly the lowest earners are the ones who are likely to need it most. But at the moment, in certain types of pension scheme over which they have no control to, to change their choice, the employer is putting them into a scheme which charges them a 25% surcharge on their own contributions that comes out of their take home pay that wouldn't happen. So their take home pay would be higher if they were in a scheme that their employer had, had chosen, which was administering tax relief differently. This is a major social injustice. It affects um, the lowest earners, most of whom are women, yeah and it's gone on for too long and it really needs to be addressed yeah it's a scandal waiting to happen yeah yeah it's a scandal all the time building up uh, and unfortunately so far the regulator has not really grasped yeah. it the government has certainly not grasped it uh, and providers governance igcs invest and trustees have all seemingly just left it to someone else yeah so perhaps you know as much as i would support the idea of auto enrollment for savings maybe this is the issue that we need to sort out as a matter of urgency first before we we think about the other which would be a huge challenge but i guess that's a conversation for another day i mean ros we could talk about these issues all day let's face it uh, but i think that's all we've got time for Thank you so much uh, for joining me and, and giving me your insights this afternoon. Pleasure. It's been a real eye opener. Pleasure. Thank you. And thank, Lovely to you. thanks to you, the viewer, uh, for joining us today. You'll be receiving a copy of the white paper after this webinar. So watch out for that. And I'm sure you'll find it as fascinating, as insightful as I did. Thank you again and have a great day.